Sometimes it's better for me to just sit back, bite my tongue, and then in four years I'll be able to say what I want. There has been a gradual institutionalization of this uh, code of, of conduct, the effect of which is to prevent people from ventilating their views. Bright students won't put up with it. Buckley Fellows believe that all perspectives must be heard and examined in good faith. They stand united against the formation of a liberal-only echo chamber at Yale. We disagree, we debate, and then at the end of the day, we remain friends. Welcome everyone to Pod and Man at Yale, the official podcast of the Buckley Institute. I'm your host, as always, Ari Schaefer, Director of Communications at the Buckley Institute. Please subscribe to Pod and Man at Yale on the App Store, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Take a second to leave us a review. It really helps. Today, we'll be looking at what it's like to be Jewish on Yale's campus with Aaron Shore, a senior, and Mitchell Dubin, a junior. Discussions like these are important now more than ever. So in true Buckley fashion, let's get right to it. Calling all Yale students, alumni, faculty, and Yale community members. The Buckley Institute, through our Fight for Yale's Future initiative, is calling on the Presidential Search Committee to ensure the next president values free speech. Join nearly 400 others in signing the petition at buckleyinstitute.com petition. Again, buckleyinstitute.com petition. Sign up today. For today's episode, I'd like to welcome Aaron Shore, a senior. Hello. And Mitchell Dubin, a junior. Good morning. In this episode, we're going to be focusing on what it's like to be Jewish on a college campus, especially since the Hamas atrocities in Israel on October 7th. In the past six weeks or so, anti-Semitism has surged across the country, with the FBI putting it at near historic levels. Pro-Palestine protests in both major cities and on campus have regularly featured anti-Semitic chants and calls for the eradication of Jews from Israel. So... What's it like as Jewish students on campus? I I will say I don't think I've actually experienced anything uh, where like someone has you know said something inappropriate to me because of my uh, because they knew I was Jewish. Um, in the past, certainly people have said various things to me because of be, because I was Israeli. Um, this time around, I actually feel like people have really just trying to give me a wide berth. You know, people who um, I know have been kind of antagonistic towards Israel in the past um, have just largely ignored me, um, which is which is fine. Uh, these, you know, not these, these are not close friends, um, but just people who I, you know, would say hi to in the, in the hallways. Um, if I see them in my residential college, if I see them in the dining hall, uh, kind of wave at them, and now they just kind of ignore me. Since October 7th, being on campus has been... I think nothing short of a nightmare for me. Wow. I to give a little a context to that, you know, I spoke with my dean just a couple of days ago about the prospect of graduating early uh, because you know because of, I wouldn't have said that a month ago or, or six weeks ago. Um, one of the things that we've learned in the last month and a half is that in in my experience, this campus is not a place that has an interest in supporting its Jewish population. Uh, it is very challenging to be here. There does not feel, I do not feel as if there is any kind of desire or, or will or clarity on the part of the leadership of the university to stand with its Jewish students during this time. And I have had a different experiences than Aaron. I have had personal, uh, I have had close friends say things to me that I think are, are quite egregious. I've also had close friends and professors say things that are quite wonderful. Um, but walking around campus, you cannot go from any place to any other place on campus without uh, without a look, without coming across some sort of graffiti, without coming across some sort of protest or event. Um, I think it's a, a really terrible place to be. And why do you think it is that the administration, or how, in what way do you think the administration or the people who run Yale are setting a tone that enables that or allows that to happen? I think that the university has an opportunity to make some pretty uh, clear actions here about what type of values they hold. What I mean by that is the university could, if they so chose, simultaneously protect everyone's right, both professors and students, to speak freely on campus about the things that they believe, and to also say one of the values that we hold at this university is to not be anti-Semites. 
And that's not something they're doing. When we see anti-Semitism proliferating on campus, which we do every single day without fail, whether it's in academic departments or run by student groups or just you know in the dorms or in the, in the dining halls, the university's response is just to say, well, they have a right to do that. And I agree, they do have a right to do it. But just because they have a right to do it doesn't mean that the university shouldn't stand up and say, but actually here at Yale, we don't believe in wiping Jews off the map. We don't believe in making this a place where Jews cannot feel safe. And you feel the Yale administration hasn't been doing that. They definitely haven't been doing that. Yeah, I, 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 I really do sympathize with Mitchell here. I, you know, I just want to kind of stress my earlier comments. I was saying uh, I haven't kind of felt personally attacked. I do, however, definitely feel like there is a lot of tension in being Jewish on campus, and um, people have been waiting for kind of strong statements from the university, uh, feeling like they are valued and protected, and those statements have, have really not just not, not happened. Um, I think really the university feels very conflicted. Um, they've kind of locked themselves into this trap where for a very long time they say, they have said that um, they don't really want to get involved in fights about free speech, um, which, you know, Obviously, the Buckley organization knows a lot about this, but um, there have been a lot of uh, ten there's been a lot of tension around the issue of free speech on campus. And the university has has largely taken the position of um, taking a step back and and letting things and letting things play out. Um, this time, it feels a little bit different because there are people walking around campus like celebrating the murder of people that we know, um, celebrating the pe- murder of people who could have been us. Um, and the university has kind of refused to do anything about it. In summer of 2020 and since Yale, other universities spoke out about the Black Lives Matter movement to support minority students, black students in particular, uh, do you feel like the Jewish community has gotten the same amount of support from the Yale administration that, you know, the black community did following the Black Lives Matter protests in summer 2020? We've, We've seen over the last couple of years all these cases where the university does take a clear moral stance say, yes, we support your right to think and and say whatever you wish, but we are being clear about what we believe here as a university. Now, they had the opportunity to do this, right? In the first 24, 36 hours, before Israel had sent a single soldier into the Gaza Strip, before Israel had dropped a single bomb, before there might have been any possible question about is Israel responding in, in the right or wrong way. Only after more than 1,000 innocent people had been killed and hundreds had been kidnapped, Nothing else had yet happened. There was a clear moral stance to take. The university passed by that opportunity, did not take it, and instead just we watched as people, as Aaron said, celebrated these events. Yeah, Mitchell brings up some really good points. You know, I really do think that the university's job is not to comment on everything that's happening in the world and really to focus on its mission. Um, But once it has started commenting on things happening around the world. Once it has kind of singled out uh, events, historical events that have happened that it thinks are worthy of commentary and of, uh, of, of kind of reactions by the administration. um, It is very difficult to not notice the fact that this one has had a little bit of a different treatment. Um, And it, and it certainly feels like there is a double standard at play um, where, you know, other things that have happened to other groups have immediately been, uh, you know, commented on by the university. Um, kind of, they have been labeled as things worth feeling badly about. They have been w- labeled as things that are kind of community tragedies that we all need to come together for. Um, up until 1,400 Israelis are murdered, um, and when that happens, suddenly um, this is not something that is worth coming together for. And it's kind of, you know, the Jews can 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 have their mourning together, and we and we did, um, but. The university is not taking part in that. Following on your point, Aaron, what does it say about the administration or about their mindset towards the situation of Jewish students on campus that they chose not to speak about this when they've spoken out about so many other students? Why the double standard? So I think the double standard goes, um, it, it comes from a place of feeling like support for uh, for Jewish people in a time where things are happening around Israel is is kind of a zero sum question. Um, where if the university comes and expresses support um, for for its Jewish community at a time when terrible things are happening in Israel, it is seen as taking a stance that uh, that kind of does not value um, the experiences or the feelings of its Muslim students, of its Palestinian students, um, in a way that it doesn't really. 
um, feel the same way when other things happen. So I, I don't think when, you know, when the Black Lives Matter protests were happening, I don't think there was anyone on campus saying, oh, you know, if we come out with support um, for this movement, uh, the, the, the white students on campus will feel like we're not paying attention to them. Or when Russia invaded Ukraine, there was not really a sentiment of, oh, if we come out with, su with support for Ukraine, the Russian students on campus are going to feel are going to feel like we're not paying attention to them. And yet, when it comes to Israel-Palestine, suddenly there is this acute awareness of if we say anything for one side, the other side will feel like we're, we are ignoring them or undervaluing them. Um, and, and I think that's, that's a little bit ridiculous. Um, are you both afraid to be Jewish on campus now? I hesitate to say that I'm afraid, because if I say that I'm afraid, I think I am giving in to some type of... of you know, threat that may or may not actually be there. Now, afraid and watching my back are two different things. I think I definitely walk around, Aaron alluded to this earlier, I definitely walk around with my eyes much more wide open, and I try to make sure that other Jewish students do as well. You know, if I'm walking around, I might be more careful about walking around with other people. Um, I might make the choice, honestly, of, of taking my kippah on or off, depending on, on where I'm going and what time of day or who I'm going to be surrounded with. Um, I, I am not afraid to be here. But I do think that the way things are going, that I will be very afraid to be here and not in the too distant future. Do you think that being Jew Jewish makes puts a target on your back, so to speak, on campus? In in a, in a limited sense, yes. I think we've we've seen anti-Semitic attacks happen at, across other campuses across the country, um, and I think it's it's not out of the question that something like that would happen at Yale. Um, you know, thankfully, nothing of that sort has happened so far. It's just a matter of time. Right. And it, it's just kind of rolling the dice, right? You wake up every day and it's like, okay, there's, you know, there's a, a small probability that something might happen today. Um, and so far it hasn't. And it might in the future and it might not. Um, but I, I know I, 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 I prefer to not live in that mindset of just constantly waiting for something to happen. I so where do you think this escalation in anti-Semitism or, you know, even hostility towards supporters of Israel is coming from? Is it progressive students? Is it, you know, right-wing students? Is it students from the Middle East who might have family or personally affected? I think most of this hostility is, is pretty clearly coming from the progressive left. There's really no other way around it. That's what's going on on campus right now. The groups and the professors and the academic departments that are proliferating this kind of anti-Semitism that's thriving on campus right now share a very similar political ideology. Uh, Aaron? Mitchell really hit the nail on its head. Um, I think the, the first few days after October 7th were really some of the most eye-opening days of my life, where I was kind of scrolling through Twitter and seeing people uh, celebrate the massacre as a victory for the decolonization movement, to a point where they've kind of abandoned all nuance. Um, it's just kind of all-out support for the Palestinians, um, even when it comes to you know mass murder of Jews. So you guys have both mentioned DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, and uh, on campus. Um, do you feel that Yale's DEI efforts serve Jewish students? Certainly not. I mean, you know, the I in DEI stands for inclusion. Um, I, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a student on this campus um, who prioritizes their Jewish identity, who feels included in any meaningful sense. Um, we have felt like... Um, we've basically been abandoned by the university to fend for ourselves. Um, I, I, yeah, I think that the, the notion that, that there is any sort of uh, inclusiveness being um, being perpetuated on campus is, is a little bit laughable at this point. I mean, by definition, the DEI movement, as we discussed, is not a movement that is going to support its Jews. The thing, though, that I want to make sure is clear is that the DEI problem is not just those you know 42 or however many administrators there are. This problem is how the movement, and led by these administrators here, have taken over other spaces on campus. They've completely taken over entire academic departments to the point where you can't even be a Jew and, say, major in, you know, maybe 10 different things, subjects in the humanities. So I want to come back to that point in a second, the event that just happened, but uh, one more question or, you know, one more um, thought about the DEI efforts on campus. So there's a 2021 Heritage Report, looked at the social media posts of, you know, several, I think it was like 700 uh, DEI officers at various universities. Uh, they found that of the tweets about Israel made by these DEI officers, 96% were critical of the Jewish state. Does that surprise either of you? That certainly does not surprise me. And I think I, we've, I've actually heard of this report several times in the past few weeks because everyone has kind of come to see it as the writing on the wall.
There's no question that the DEI movement has to be completely eradicated. It is a not only a cancer for the Jews, but it's, it's just fundamentally anti-Western, anti-American, and it's dangerous. You know, whatever starts with the Jews is not going to end with us. So, Aaron, I just want to go to a, you mentioned uh, an event that was co-sponsored by the Yale Department that you felt the speakers were making anti-Semitic comments. Do you think Yale should be more careful about which events it's sponsoring? I think the university first just actually needs to take responsibility for the things that it's doing before it can even begin to critically examine what those things are. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it's very clear that the university does bear responsibility for ensuring that the the the, the events that it hosts um, do not make students feel like they are unsafe fundamentally. Um, and, and there's a lot of work to be done there, as we very clearly see. The question that I have in my mind, which, you know, I don't really want to see the answer to, but I really wonder is... Let's say there was a, a group, a, a group of students that decided to come together and form, you know, the Yale KKK club or a Yale Nazi club, right? W would they receive funding from the university? So when a group, the group calls itself Yaleys for Palestine, right? That is that is a positive vision of Yaleys for Palestine, right? It's not Yaleys against Jews, um, and it, you know, it is it is good and worthy that we have a, a student group on this campus that is that is there to support the Palestinian struggle. However, once that group you know, organizes an event on October 8th or 9th, celebrating the resistance after 1,400 innocent people are slaughtered in their homes, right, they have completely lost all legitimacy. That is not Yaleys for Palestine. As a matter of fact, they are Yaleys against Palestine because now tens of thousands of Palestinians are dead because of the war that started because of this thing. This is not a celebration of the resistance. This is a celebration of death and a celebration of the murder of Jews. And we need to be very, very clear on that, that this is not, this is not a positive vision of Yaleys for Palestine. This is Yaleys for killing Jews. So what do you think the university needs to do to make Jewish students feel more comfortable on campus? Outside, anything beyond you know, just at least supporting you, which is a low bar, but is there anything they could actively be doing to make it easier to be on campus? I think what we've been waiting to see is a very clear stance by the university saying that what happened on October 7th was a crime against humanity itself and that anyone who celebrates it is not a part of the community of learning and of light and truth that we think ourselves to be part of. Yeah, sure. Would it be nice to, you know, maybe allocate some funding for this or that? Yeah, that, that would be nice. But really, all we're asking for is some moral clarity, which they refuse to give. So what message do you have to, you know, alumni, uh, people who graduated, or people just watch Yale or watch campuses, and seeing what's on the news and are you know, a little nervous by what they're seeing. Do you have any message to them before we sign off? I think, well, you know, in this in this podcast, we definitely painted a very grim picture of campus. I want to stress that I think Yale has been a much better place for Jews to be in the past few weeks than many of its peer institutions. Uh, as, as, as numerous and as deep as these problems are, they are worse elsewhere. Um, so... But there is a lot of work to be done. And I hope that, you know, anyone who can can apply pressure on the university to do something about this, will apply pressure on the university to do something about this. This is, you know, all the warning lights are on right now. All the red flags are up. There is a serious problem at this place, and I hope that we can we can learn from this issue uh, and, and try to address these problems meaningfully. Aaron's totally right. You know, I've been thinking about what does it mean to apply pressure, and I think this goes in two ways. One is any, any way that you can encourage the university um, whether that's through financial contributions or through connections that you have with faculty or leadership or student groups, any way that you can help guide them towards the moral clarity that we're so desperately looking for is exactly what we need. This is not a place for Jews right now, and unless people can really put on the pressure that, that Aaron is applying and, and make things change, we're going to have to pivot to a new strategy for, for Jews to, to thrive in this country. Well, Aaron, Mitchell, thank you for joining Pod and Man at Yale and having you know, a serious but frank discussion. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Now with that, let's get right to our interview with Kenneth Marcus, founder and chairman of the Louis D. Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law. He joined our Supreme Court review panel back in September. Check it out on our website or head to our YouTube channel for more details. I'd like to welcome our guest, Kenneth Marcus. Kenneth L. Marcus is founder and chairman of the Louis D. Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law, distinguished fellow of the Center for Liberty and Law at George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School, and author of 
The Definition of Antisemitism and Jewish Identity and Civil Rights in America. During his public service career, Marcus served as Assistant U.S. Secretary of Education for Civil Rights, Staff Director at the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, and General Deputy Assistant U.S. Secretary of Housing and Urban Development for Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. Thanks for joining us on Pod and Man at Yale. Good to be here. Uh, you testified recently for the House of Representatives Committee on Education and Workforce, testified several times before that. Uh, during your recent testimony, uh, you said that anti-Semitism on campus was at historic levels, even before the October 7th terror attacks against Israel. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what you were seeing on campus, again, before October 7th? Over the course of this fall, we were so thinly stretched at the Louis D. Brandeis Center that my uh, staff attorneys were uh, getting sick, were getting exhausted. Oh, wow. I felt we really needed either to expand the staff or do something. Uh, we were uh, feeling at an anecdotal or personal level uh, what the data was showing, which is that anti-Semitic incidents on college campuses, like anti-Semitism worldwide, uh, were reaching historic levels. They'd never been so high. That was the world as we knew it on October 6th. On October 7th, the world took a turn uh, quite tragically for the worse. Uh, our intake from college and university students around the country exploded. Um, certainly the uh, volume of intake uh, increased by much more than tenfold uh, from those record levels uh, during the subsequent weeks, even before we announced a partnership with the Anti-Defamation League and Hillel International that resulted in a hotline which has brought in uh, substantially more uh, uh, concerns, complaints, and reports uh, than we had been getting even during the first three or four weeks after October 7. So this situation now is not just uh, historic record setting and unprecedented within certainly uh, our lifetimes, uh, but it is exponentially higher uh, than the uh, record level that we had reached uh, in the period leading up to October 7. Do you have any sense of what drove that recent spike? I think that there were a couple of factors. In general, things were getting worse over time, partly as a result of distance from the Holocaust, partly the wearing away of the inoculation effect that we seem to have had as a, as a culture and as a society. Um, but then uh, any time that Israel would be in the news, uh, either uh, because it was perceived to have been an aggressor or because things were going badly there for Israelis. And th those tended to be the bad months or bad years mm -hmm. uh, when there would be spikes. So we saw particular spikes during various uh, periods, usually correlating with incidents in the Middle East uh, over a period of time when things were gradually deteriorating at any rate. So we're focused on Yale but you know it's hard not to um, see the news stories about what's going on on other campuses. But it sounds like the things that your center is dealing with um, and is handling is much larger and much broader than what you read in the news. Like there are a lot of stories there that you know it seems you have that don't get reported. What are the kind of things you're seeing on other campuses that aren't making national headlines? I would say that I have seen in newspapers or the blogosphere, only two or three incidents of assault on Jewish students, maybe a little bit more than that, four or five. Uh, but there are four more that we're hearing about directly or indirectly that aren't getting reported. For instance, in one southeastern state, uh, a uh, colleague uh, said that there were a number of students who simply did not want to bring publicity to the situation, but there were a number of, uh, of assaults. Uh, that's one uh, sort of thing. But just in general, the volume, we hear about a few highly publicized uh, incidents, uh, often at uh, universities that are well known, um, either because they're large or prestigious or in major media markets. Uh, but there are also incidents in many other places. There was a period of time when people would ask me, what are the hotspot campuses that are having problems that you need to focus on. 
And I would be able to give them an answer. I would be able to tell them on a given year, these are the 10 or 12 or 15 campuses where we anticipate that there will be problems next semester based on the fact that we've had problems this semester and last semester. There were predictable patterns. Nowadays, we don't have that anymore. Nowadays, there really is no campus where we would be surprised to find problems uh, because the situation, the degree of anti-Semitism on college campuses has reached a far greater saturation level uh, than I had seen earlier in my career. So in your perspective, there are no campuses that are safe for Jewish students? There are a few campuses that we haven't heard from, but... Um, that doesn't mean we know for sure they're safe. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to find them. I would say that the campuses that we haven't heard from typically have a small number of Jewish students. Mm -hmm. uh, and that might be why we don't hear from them, or it might be that the problems are not, uh, are not so great. Uh, every once in a while, someone like a proud parent or professor tells me that the university that they're associated with or where they send their child is an exception to the problem. And I usually wince when I hear that because I know that often in the past when someone has said to me, well, you know what, we just don't have that problem here. Like clockwork, um, we then get a uh, complaint from that very campus within the next uh, few weeks. Oh, wow. Uh were if a Jewish student were to come to you and ask you, are there a couple of campuses you could recommend that you think are better or worse? And I don't know if this is a question that you can comfortably answer, but are there any campuses that you think are doing better, especially in the last few weeks? I get that question a lot. There are university administrators who have done certain positive things. I think, for instance, that Ben Sass, the former U.S. senator who is now president of the University of Florida, wrote a particularly good letter uh, condemning uh, some of the uh, Hamas-related situation uh, there. So there are administrators who do certain things that I think are uh, positive. Um, but uh, at this point, if uh, someone were to come to me, say a high school student, and say, uh, where should I go to college where I won't have to worry about anti-Semitism? I really can't tell them that there is any place in the United States where they won't have to worry about anti-Semitism. There might be a few places that have been particularly ugly lately, mm -hmm. but they really ought to make their uh, college um, decision based on certain other factors. Maybe asking specific questions about some campuses that have had particular problems, but without any particular confidence that if you go elsewhere, uh, you will be completely safe. What kind of things, I guess, tangible things, and you mentioned some of them in your testimony, do you think, I guess, students, the administrators themselves can take to you say, reverse the things that, you know, the things we saw on campus, that the response we saw from students and Y'all definitely saw from students to celebrate what happened on October 7th. What actually is there to be done? I think you have to understand that we didn't get here overnight, and we're not going to get out of this overnight. This is not just a random or organic response to one historical development. This is something that had to take some time to evolve. This notion that we could on some very fine college campuses have this extraordinary celebration of atrocity and have groups that are claiming not just to agree with the uh, uh, terrorism, but to consider themselves to be a part of that movement. I think you have to look at everything within an institution, starting perhaps with diversity, equity, and inclusion, the part of an institution which is supposed to deal with problems of this sort, but which in fact may be exacerbating them. I think you have to ask the question, when we pour such resources into programs that are supposed to enable us to live with greater respect and dignity and gentleness with one another, and yet, we're seeing exactly the opposite. What is 
driving this uh, isn't coincidental that we have moved in these programs towards a way of thinking in which people are divided between supposed oppressors and oppressed, in which uh, white so, so-called supremacists are distinguished from uh, other uh, groups, in which we are taught that there are some groups that are exercising power and privilege that is oppressive to others. Um, it is unavoidable that some minority groups end up being castigated, stereotyped, and uh, marginalized as a result of this process. Uh, whether Jews, Judaism, Jewishness, and anti-Semitism are added to DEI or not, what we have in DEI is an ideology in which it is all too easy for people to think of Jews as being the hyper-white uh, supremacist uh, group. And this feeds exactly the sort of ideology uh, which seems to be leading some people to support uh, the worst sort of terrorism. It's not just in DEI programs. It's, I would say it's especially ironic and unfortunate when it's in DEI programs. But you can see it in curricula. You can see it in academic work. You can see it throughout uh, our elite cultural institutions, uh, including especially uh, colleges and universities. So, uh, so I do have to cut it. Yeah, we make it pretty short because the Shabbat's coming. So I do have one last question. Uh, you, this is a little more general, more broad. Uh, do you have a you know, message for Jewish students on campus who are worried uh, you know, about just being Jewish on campus? I spoke to a few for the other part of the podcast. Message for them about how to go about um, their time on campus and maybe any thoughts for their parents who are worried about their children's safety? I can't tell them not to be worried. This is a, a dark time. It's important to take precautions in order to be safe. Uh, at the same time, I think we have to remember that we're not alone, that there are friends and allies to be found, uh, and that one should not uh, in, indulge in uh, paranoia or undue pessimism. Uh, moreover, uh, it is not decided in any uh, historically inevitable way that what we're seeing now will continue to get worse. Uh, it is, I believe, in our hands. Uh, it is not too late in America or in this, in this world. We are still surrounded by people of goodwill and good character who I believe remain very much the majority in this country and perhaps in this uh, world. But we certainly do have risk. Um, what we've seen has been a worsening problem, and it could get much worse still to come. However, if we fight it, if we make it our mission to say we will not let this happen again, uh, it is certainly possible that we can turn this around. And if it is possible, that we can turn this around. It is necessary that we do everything we can to do so. Well, thanks so much. I really appreciate you uh, sparing some of your time with us. I know you're very busy. So thanks so much for joining us on Pot and Man at Yale. Very good to be with you. That wraps up an important discussion on Pot and Man at Yale. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. And always remember, for God, for country, for Yale, in that order.